Looks like, looks like they know the routine. So any, any rock climbers, if anyone's here, you've got uh, school age children. We've got children's church for them upstairs. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate it. Wave to Dennis. Look at that good haircut. Handsome man. That's good. Hey, uh, guys, welcome. So here we are. I just think it, it's good to mention this is what we would call a worship service, right? Worship being, uh, sometimes you have to go back to certain basics. I appreciate what Josh White shared with us last week. He basically called into question, there's a lot of the things that we believe have honestly uh, come into our consciousness and our understanding from something someone else, another man or woman has told us, which may or may not be true. And so I think we have to sort of remind ourselves my whole job here today is probably not to tell you anything new, but to simply remind you of what's true and try to encourage you to worship God. So here in this worship room, worship center, whatever you want to call it, we give honor, respect, adoration, obedience to the being that's greater than us. That's worship, right? And who we're worshiping is, is God, the creator of all things, and his son, Jesus Christ, who's our savior who came down from heaven, took the form of a man, and not, not a noble man, not a rich man, or a powerful man, and built a kingdom that you don't see in the flesh. A kingdom, not of this world. And so today, like we give him that honor, that respect, that glory, that weight, that importance, that consideration. So as I'm going to share with you some stuff that was written in a letter and other parts of what we call the scripture, right, or the Bible, and I pray that the Lord will touch your heart with it and, and teach you. Uh, there's also other ways in which you can worship, uh, singing like we just did, singing praises. Guys, back in the corner here, you'll see a sign that says prayer wall. We've got people back there throughout the entire service that would love to pray with you. Something comes up. God's like, go pray, go sit over there with them. You can tell them or not say a word and just ask them to pray over you. You could also do that. That's not a holy place. Uh, the holy place is you. If you're a believer in Christ and you hold the Holy Spirit, but we want to love you and minister to you in that way. Uh, those who worship through giving, we have opportunities for that. Every other week, uh, you know, often we will have communion here so different ways of worshiping so before we get into the study of some more verses in first john let me just pray uh, lord we come here to give you honor glory praise our attention lord we ask that you just continue your work in transforming us jesus through the power of the holy spirit through the renewal of our mind through the rebirth of our heart and we just pray this jesus in your power in your name amen Okay, grab your Bibles. If you're, if you're just joining us today, we're actually going through, uh, in your Bible, it's called 1 John. And it's a letter written right, by John, the same John that you read about in the Gospels, one of the disciples of Christ, the same John that wrote Revelation and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the Gospel of John. He's writing to Christians. And so here we kind of pick up where we're at. Chapter 2, verse 28 and 29 says this, and now, little children, this, this little children, let me just tell you, the word here means students. So who he's writing to are the people that follow God, right? The people who follow his teaching, the people who are students. These aren't, these aren't people who don't believe. These aren't strangers or people who've never heard of God, but believers. And now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence not to shrink from him at shame in his coming. Basically, it's saying, hey, students, disciples, stay, remain, continue in Jesus so that when Jesus comes back, you'll have confidence in the way that you speak, the way that you behave. You'll be bold. You won't be afraid. You won't shy back. You won't shrink from him. You won't be, be ashamed or have fear when he's coming. Verse 29, and if you know that he is righteous, who's he? Jesus, awesome. So here's what we want to do. I want you guys to 
help me out because I really believe, I don't want to just lecture at you. I don't want you to think, wow, that guy's really smart. No, I want you to hear this. I want it to penetrate your heart. I want it to change you. Otherwise, I'm wasting my time. Okay, Let's, so join me in this. So he is Jesus. If you know that he is righteous, what's righteous mean? What's that? Right standing with God, yeah. Right, right behavior, right conduct, just, justice, all these things. So if Jesus is all those things, you should be sure that everyone who practices, the idea of practices is to do or to make, like there's an action to this. So the one who practices the same righteousness, right, this rightness, this justice, this doing the right things has been born and the word here could be either born like created a first time or, or recreated of him. Who's him again? Cool. So here's a truth that I need to give to you because if you're going to believe, this is something that so God is just really like hammering home, Will. Like give them the full truth. It may be harder for them to digest it, but once they do, they're really going to believe it. Because what we can't afford in this time is people who half believe, who only believe in their mind, but, but really believe at, at their heart. So practicing, here's the truth, practicing righteousness is what anyone who is spiritually reborn through the Holy Spirit should be doing. I'll say that again. Practicing righteousness is something that anyone who is spiritually reborn through the Holy Spirit should be doing that leads us to what i would say is kind of an obvious question are you practicing righteousness awkward silence you got to add that in there a little bit are you practicing righteousness you said trying to that is practicing right so th that's awesome. So understand this. Let me just put this information out there for you. We do this because Jesus is righteous and we belong to him. Okay? We don't do this so that Jesus will accept us. It's the order, order of everything is so important. Man, the more time I spend studying, the more time I... I spend in prayer the more time I spend in quiet. I'm telling you what, the order is everything. And so we, we read this Bible and, and people come at us with like, wow, Jesus did it all. And his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness are everything. It's true. And then we have other people who are like looking at uh, information written for us in the scriptures and it, and it says, oh man, if you... If you love him, do what he asks you to do. Yeah, that's true too. They're both true at the same time. So we do this. We practice righteousness not to get Jesus' favor or God's favor. But we practice righteousness because he is righteous and we want to be more like him and because he has already done this for us. So you have to sort of sit in that question, am I practicing righteousness? Well, I can imagine, you know, an explorer who comes over a ridge and, and, and comes into a new land and finds new things. I, I imagine if you came over a ridge and you went and you saw a large body of water. And the larger the body, the more true this would be. How could you uh, simply leave that body of water by one glance at it and have a good understanding to go home and tell other people what you found? I mean, it would take time, right? You couldn't just take a little sample of that water and bring it home and they would say, oh, I know what lake, what this is that you found. No, you'd have to experience it. You'd have to sit in it. And so what I found here, Lord, it, it, the Lord's paused me in, in my spirit with this because what happens, guys, is I know like those of us who are trying to teach from, from the Bible are telling you, okay, are you practicing righteousness, right? And then we'll... We'll pull in some other scripture, and the effect is this. You understand you're supposed to practice righteousness, so you'll do a couple things. One, you'll feel really bad about yourself because you're not. Okay? 
uh, two, you're going to distract so you don't have to do anything with it. Or, or three, you're going to fake it. Yep, sure enough, do. I'm doing it, Will. Practicing righteousness. Yeah. For me, I don't want to lead you, honestly, like down any of those condemning paths. Because what the scripture here said is, the only way you're going to practice righteousness and it, for, for it to really do something is if you've been reborn in him. So we've got a huge problem here. Here's another thing I'll present to you. Here's another issue. When I'm thinking about you, and I'm thinking about your souls, right? I feel responsible. And, and I know this. In what we call the church in North America, there's tons of people who sit in chairs every Sunday and honestly really don't believe. And it's not really their fault. Some of it is. Some of it they're wrestling with it, which is fair. The other part is they're, they're taught wrong. And so what I have to do is, is stop a second and say there's a conditional thing here. Practice righteousness. Oh, dang, I'm not doing it. Well, maybe it's because you haven't been reborn. Maybe it's you haven't been reborn, so when Jesus comes back, like he found with the Pharisees, he says, you guys are practicing your righteousness before men. Like, so that they will respect you and love you and think that you're great. Instead of practicing your righteousness before God because you belong to him. So I can't jump ahead. It's like Jim going to you and saying, hey, weld these two pieces of metal together. And if you never knew how to weld, and then I let you try it. And then I said, that's an awful weld job. Jim, that's horrible. What's wrong with you, right? That is what we are doing in our faith. Like, do this, be righteous, do the right thing, but there's no training, no power in which for you to use to try to become righteous. It's crazy. It's insanity. So here's what we've come upon. We've come upon a huge lake. I'm talking Lake Michigan. Like, you can't see across it. And so God's like, I know that you're going through 1 John, but stop here. Well, okay, Lord, stop here. We want to talk about this. Have you been born of him? Years ago, Brandy did a video, if you were here with the kids, for, was it Father's Day or Mother's Day? Father's Day, right? Yeah, Father's Day, and the kids asked him a series of questions, and one of the little girls said the cutest thing. She kept answering this. She said, uh, she said, my, my mommy didn't born me that? I don't know. My mama didn't born me that. That's what she said. I don't know. My mama didn't born me that. And so I think about that when I'm looking at this. It's like, I don't know how to be this or to do that or to have the power to do that because my father didn't born me that yet. Because what you've been born into is, is the flesh. And the flesh in your body, which was born, was brought into this world. And in this world, there's sin and self-preservation and self-protection right, and, and danger and peril and lust of the eyes and pride of life and lust of the flesh and all those things playing at you. You heard of doctrine. What's doctrine mean? We were talking about this, right, Rick? Right, Steve? So, so doctrine, a doctrine has to do with like a teaching of truth, right? The Latin word is actually about instruction or teaching. And, and so the idea of that is we in the Christian faith, we, we get these words or these sections of scripture out of the book and we build these teachings, these truth statements around them. And one of them, which is part of the, part of the Christian faith, is this doctrine of regeneration. Heard of this before? Um. And here's why I think it's so important you read your Bible, because that's a huge doctrine. Like, it's like seminary classes on this thing. But did you know the word that this doctrine is coming from is only two places in the New Testament? <laughs> it's only two places, but it's so important. Because other words are implying into that. And so I want to I park on this a little bit and talk about it. First of all, let me, let me define this regeneration word. It's actually two words put together. It's like palin. 
which is again, and Genesis, which is birth. So it's like to birth again. You see that? So the word that we're calling the generation, this thing's really acting up on me today. Um, so the idea of regeneration is to be born again. It's, it's the communication or the existence of like a new life is what we're talking about there. Um, maybe that'll be better. Where this comes from, let me take you there. Titus 3. So Titus is a letter written by Paul to a fellow worker in Christ named Titus. And this is chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. And we'll, we'll look at this again in and, and some coming weeks. Um, and it says this. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the work done by us, in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of, here's the word, regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Okay, so there it is in the scripture. Why is regeneration so important? Well, we, we saw that before. In order for you to practice righteousness, uh, in, in future weeks, we'll talk about this. Like, we can't enter the kingdom of God unless we've been born again. Uh, a, another, another thing that's super important that I find is there's sort of the positive and negative of this. Like, how can, how can these things happen? How can you be born into a world of sin and the penalty of sin is death, but then you have the mercy of God who takes your old heart and gives you a new heart Right? who no longer calls you a sinner but calls you a saint. There's these two, these two competing sides, and how can they both be true? Well, it's only true if at some point there's death of an old and birth of a new. Do you see that? What's written for us, the instruction that's given for us is here's what was going on before and all the bad things, and here's all the goodness that comes once that death happens and then new birth happens. Returns. Make sense? So what you need and I need, and here's a word of caution. When we enter something like this, here's the best way for you to avoid changing yourself. Okay? So everyone listen up. Everyone listen up, because I'm thinking of every one of you and me. Here's the easiest way not to change. Take everything that you read, everything that you're taught, and just apply it to everyone else. There's your shortcut. And here's what we can do. We can so be, be so busy in our Christian work that we never look at ourselves. And then we can be so busy in looking at ourselves, we put ourselves on the pedestal, making ourselves God, that we never do the Christian work. So this idea of regeneration is so important to you because you need to look through this lens to see yourself, to see God's goodness, and to live with patience, kindness, and grace for those around you, both. You need, and I need, the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Lord, what do we do with this? Now, part of what, what God has asked me to do, what the people of this church have asked me to do is, is there's a, there's a picture, a metaphor here. It's, it's that of a shepherd, right? So I have to sort of know the people that I'm ministering to. So I get to know some of you. Some of, we don't know each other. Some of you, we know each other more um, and trust that the God, God will reveal to me where he wants me to take you. And, and this is where God has asked me to, to take you today. As we're talking about this big thing of regeneration, I think the most important thing you can do to start with is understand that we need it. We need it. You need it. I need it. And it really makes sense if you want, because if you look at your life, no matter how old you are, of everything that happened before this moment, even up to this morning, because I know Sunday mornings are famous for being miserable mornings, right? That's when great fights happen between spouses or siblings or 
brothers and sisters or parents and children. Uh, it's everyone's more sick on Sunday morning. There's just something to do with the fact that we have an enemy who wants us to stop worshiping God. Okay? So you need this. You need a fresh start. Here's another thing I wrestle with. I wrestle with this. Your experience, your observations are super important. They really are. They are really important. I, I, I'm serious for all of you. Your, what you experience, what you see, what you observe is extremely important. There's a, there's a lot of weight in that. But you know what's also extremely important, even more important, is truth. Okay? Truth is even more important than experience and feelings. But truth doesn't necessarily say your feelings doesn't matter. Truth invites your feelings to dance. That's the way that I see it. That's not from the Bible, okay? This is what God showed me. There, it's not the Macarena, right? It's like a waltz, right? Sometimes you're forward, right? Sometimes you're the side, right? Sometimes you're, this is the dancing, right, of your feelings and your experience. And so I need to talk a little bit now about, about your experience and how this is true. Because regeneration, a big question if you look at it, we'll get into this more, is, is this an instantaneous thing or is this something that happens over time? Because here's the danger, right? You come into church and maybe this happens to you, right? Like somewhere you were at church and maybe, or you were at youth camp or you were watching something online and there's this appeal to say, hey, there's salvation for you. And maybe you had to go up front and talk to some holy man, right? Or you had to raise your hand or fill out a card or a vacation Bible school. It was the third night they talked to you, right? So um, then you said, yes, I want to be a Christian. And then you read these scriptures that say you're a new creation in Christ and you've been born again. And like now you have a new start. The problem is you were eight. And since then, you've done a lot of bad crap, okay? Just use my terms. You've done a lot of bad crap. Bad stuff has happened to you. Your heart has been broken a thousand times. It's become hardened and callous. And you don't feel like any part of a new creation. And so you come into a building like this and you have to pretend that your heart is, is soft and hasn't been hardened. Right? Because what was offered to you is, uh, I was supposed to be different and new at that time. And some of you, you guys were like 25, you found Jesus, got off crack. It was easy to see your life was different, right? But other people, it wasn't like that. Maybe it was college or, you know, I don't know. And both of those stories, I don't mean to demean either one of those, but the reality of this is God is at work in you. And most of these words that we have, like this word salvation, if you begin to study the words of it, salvation is used often to mean in a moment in time, like I was going to die and you pulled me out of the way of the train. Salvation in the moment, right? But then it's the same word that can be used to mean I was being saved from myself over time. Does that make sense? So our language doesn't help, right? Like, we're translating different meaning words into the same thing. Salvation, it can mean instantaneous. So you're like, I was saved. That means I should have it all together on day one. But what the Bible says is, hey, you were saved and keep on being saved. You get that? It's different ideas, same English word. That's what regeneration is. Regeneration itself, the word has to do with being born again, right? Right? to be recreated, to be reborn. In a moment, yeah, you're reborn. However, look at the parallels, right, when we talk about the parallels in the shadows of this earth. If you had a brand new baby, they are a new creation. Who is that baby? You don't know yet. You just don't know. I mean, some of the things, they're just born in them. I mean, you can, you can debate nature and nurture, whether this was created in them or it was taught, but you, you can never... Take both of those stimulus out, right? You can never create them with nothing. 
<laughs> and you can never take away all their experiences. So no matter how much you want to, from a scientific standpoint, uh, pr um, prove one way or the other, what I can tell you is it's obvious if you have a few kids from the same two parents, you'll see that people learn things and people are certain ways both. Okay? So when you're created, you become a new creation, like a baby. But you've got to learn everything again. How do you walk? How do you talk? How do you use the bathroom, right? What to eat, what to say, what, what you're into. Everything is taught again. The difference between being reborn is you have the wisdom of everything you used to do. And the system's still in place to make you the same person you used to be. And because of free will, you can continue to do the same garbage you did before. But that doesn't stop the fact that you were reborn. Okay? Okay, Will, where are you going, man? I'm rewinding. 1 John 2, verse 12. John wrote this. Keep in mind, he's writing to Christians. So, and the Christians, I'm writing to you, little children. That word means students. Technion. Because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who's from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. Why this? We, we've got to talk about this. We've got to talk about the the need and then the invitation to be regenerated. The first group that he talks to here, well, not first in order, but the first in, uh, I would say, in development, is the idea of children. We talked about this a few weeks ago in brief. So now let's take a look at our lives as a picture of what's being written here. Tell me about children. What do you guys know about children? They can be happy. They mimic their parents. They're teachable. Yes. Because the word here actually refers to as far as a development, like half, half grown, right? So it's like real children. It's not the students. This is the half grown ones, the, the children. What were you going to say over here? I'm sorry. They don't have a lot of experience. Yeah. What else with children? Yeah. Curious and have not known pain. Yeah. Self-centered. They don't know better. Yeah. Yep. Eager to learn. No filter. Rebellious sometimes. Yeah. You know what's really cool what you guys just did? is you, you've just brought up some negatives and some positives. And when I, was, when I was meeting with some of the young adults that we meet together in the church here, and they asked this question, they, they were asking about that negative and positive. And what, what John is saying here, and this, is, this applies to us too, even though here we are some like 1,900 years later, right? And some change uh, when this letter is written. We still, within our midst of any fellowship of people who are trying to follow Jesus, will have these three groups. And they asked me a brilliant question. They said, is that such a bad thing? Right, because isn't that the push? Isn't that the push? Like, condemn you for being a child? Like, grow up. And, and yeah, we all want to grow up in the faith, but let's be honest about where we're at. Okay? Because from what I can see based on what he said, and I say this with some hesitation. I am in no way the judge who gets into heaven. I'm not the gatekeeper. I don't make that decision. Thank you, God. I don't want that job. But here's what I'll tell you. Apparently, there are people who believe in a belief that saves who, will, who still act like children. And so if they die acting like children, I don't see from what John said here that they're out of the kingdom of God. And if they act like young adults or if they act like parents... Now, this is no way permission to keep acting immature because there is consequence for that, and we're living it. But I love that question. 
can we be honest and real about the fact that all three of these exist and is that such a bad thing and, and why? Some things you guys said here. They've got energy and they're excited, right? They're excited and they're energetic and they're bold and they're not afraid. And, right? A child, they're all those good things. On the negative side, they don't know what they're doing yet. They don't have the awareness. Here's a huge one. Okay? On the positive, one thing they said here is John said in his letter, I'm writing to you because you know the Father. To bore you with another word, meaning this word know here, actually has a broad, a broad meaning. And it could mean to know something as far as to understand or comprehend it. But it also could be used to know, like really know through experience something. So praying about this and looking at it, it's like I see it. If I'm a child, I've come to faith. Why? Because I know. I'm aware I've accepted the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. And so I've entered into the faith, right? But what I lack is what? What someone said, experience. Right? Yeah. They don't know evil. Yeah. They're, they're what, what Paul wrote in the letter to the Christian church at Ephesus, we call it Ephesians 4, verse 14. He said, so that we may no longer be children. Oh, here he's going to define children. Tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Hey, middle school teachers, I mean, come on. This is your life, right? The drama of those kids. Right? Yeah? Parents. Like, this is it, man. The sky is falling, and every wind, every doctrine, every meme becomes the newest truth, right? And it continues on. You go to college, like one of my sons is taking a college class, and basically everything is a TED Talk they're giving to him, which is some person that really thinks they're smart and wants to talk about it for a long time. But because it's intellectual, it's so much more sophisticated than simple memes, but it's really the same dang thing. Let's be honest. So children are carried back and forth. You're like, yes, no, oh, yeah, no. This is the best thing ever. No, this is the worst thing ever. I hate you. I love you, right? I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to live forever, right? This is kids, and this is what Paul is saying. And what, what the problem, guys, is Christians are acting like this. And this puts me in a weird spot because I want us to go out and serve the world. But if you go into someone else's life and you act like this, oh, you know what will happen? I see this. They'll show up to church with you, and you spoke lots of really cool stuff to them, and then you start acting like a child, and they disappear off the face of the earth because your life did not present a testimony that was true with God. And and once again, let me model this. I'm not just saying this to you. I'm saying this to me. Childlike behavior. Back and forth. All over the place. Tossed by every wind of doctrine. Every truth teaching. I mean, geez, I think, guys, it's not an exaggeration. I've heard like in the past month, five people say, God hates this. Five different things. None of them is from the Bible. None of them is from the Bible. And actually, they were using it to refute things that were from the Bible. I mean, come on, right? That's what this is. Every YouTube thing, everything you read, everything a pastor tells you, you got to stop just listening to us. Like, you've got to read this yourself. And I'm not saying this is some sort of legalistic garbage, but please read it and understand it yourself. Otherwise, you will continue to be a child all your life. And even when you get to heaven, you'll be like, oh, man, I missed out on so much richness because I was afraid. Because all I listened to is whatever devotional I have. Praise God for a devotional, right? All I ever did was listen to what the pastor said. Praise God for pastors or a Sunday school teacher. Praise God for a Sunday school teacher or my small group teacher. But what is God speaking to your heart? Children. The next thing it says is young men. And I'm not saying this to be PC, but because I really believe that he's talking to both men and women here, right? And I'm talking to both women. So I'll say young adults. Young adults. It says a little more for the young adults. Young men, he says he's writing to them because they've overcome the evil one. Right? That's what you were saying. They don't know what's evil. Now, now they're getting getting some truth in there, right? 
and because they're strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. I mean, these are positive things. What else do you guys see about young adults? They're still learning. Yeah, what, what other picture of the shadow of being a young adult do you see? Either you saw that in yourself or the people around you. What else? Could be negative or positive. So kind of like they're not, they're not uh, vacillating so much. They're starting to become a little more still. So yeah, they're starting to make their own decisions. And they're, you know, deciding, hey, do, will I be a Christian? If so, which church will I go to? They're building their own life, right? So it's not, not necessarily the wind's not tossing them. They start to know some truth. They start to they become aware, right? Yeah. Independence. Yep. They look forward to the future. There's a hope, right? Yeah. I mean, I won't, I won't pick a job. I won't pick a job because it's bad, but there are certain jobs that people do because it fits their life, not because it was when they were 13 what they dreamed of doing, right? How many people, like, are working, work the career they thought they would work when they were 16, 17, 18, 19? Most of us don't. Yeah, some of us do. But a lot of us don't because we didn't uh, know what was all the implications of choosing that life, right? I love babies. I want to deliver them. Okay, do you want to miss every major family event because someone has a baby? No. So you don't do that, right? Like, I want to be a movie star, so I've got to, like, give this year to this movie to make a million dollars. Well, do you want to be there for your kids? Yeah, well, good luck trying to do both, right? Maybe that year you're off. But. So there's these, imp- there's these implications, decisions, the complexities maybe um, a young adult might not see. You know the other thing? is uh, I've heard a few people mention this one. I love this saying. It says, you know, if you give a boy a hammer, the whole world becomes a nail, right? And this is what the young adult phase is like. You got something, and now you're knowing how to do it, right? You're getting some mastery in this one thing. Pretty soon, that's what you want to do all the time. Like, oh, I know how to fix this, (laughs) right? Like, that was not wise, but that's cool that you know how to hammer, right? Yeah. Um, do you see that? Like, I mean, I say this in humility, but I mean, knowing young adults and knowing myself, you start to understand something, and once you get the understanding of that thing, you, you apply it widely across the world. And it doesn't always work in every one of those areas. Okay. So you can see based on our experience, right, that you can see this, like, man, they've overcome the evil one. They're not vacillating so much. It's not quite as dramatic, you know? And because they're strong, right? We need some strength. You don't need a nap, right? You don't need a nap. Your back doesn't creak when you stand up. These are all good things for the kingdom of God. Back to that question. Yes, we need the young adults. And the word of God abides in you. You start getting truth. Well, Here's, here's church words like you become overzealous, right? This is how the Pharisees would act a lot. They, they got a lot of truth, and this is how Christians act a lot. I've got this truth, and I'll beat you with it because it's my hammer. I also think I am the smartest person alive, right? That is part of being young. Yeah, you guys don't get it, right? You get married when you're a young adult like Brandy and I. You're like, I don't know why. I don't know why everyone thinks this is so hard. I mean, this should be pretty simple. Like, we're going to do it differently <laughs> right now. It's going to be simple. We're going to, you know, it's going to go this way. It's going to go that way. Of course, I'm going to live to 90 and be healthy all the way through, right? Surprise. Young adults, you're hopeful, but you're naive. And you're strong. And you're so focused on the truth, right? Here's a good example, Peter. You guys remember Peter? So right here I've put Matthew 26. So what's going on here is is Peter is talking, right? And he's so zealous, man. This is the guy. He did bold things like, and Peter declared in verse 35, Matthew 26, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you to Jesus. And all the other disciples like, yeah, yeah, right? And then they did. Like everyone left him. But a little bit later what's funny is, uh, he goes to pray. So that's verse 35, okay? Then verse 40. We're talking four verses, four sentences later. 
Jesus is going to pray and they all fall asleep. <laughs> right? They all fall asleep while he's going to pray. And then Jesus says to them, and then he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. He says, couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Here's the challenge for the young adult. They don't have the experience. They don't have the failures, honestly, which are sometimes the best teachers to know what's coming. Then the third category. Fathers, parents. So if you see something in, it written down in the scriptures twice, what does that tell you? What do you think? What's that? Pay attention. Yeah, that's great. This is important. I'm repeating myself. I'm repeating myself. I'm repeating myself. Pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. This is important. This is important. Get this. Get this. Here's what he says about parents twice. I'm writing to you because you know him who's from the beginning. Wait a second. Well, that's exactly what he said to the children. No. No, not really. If you look at the words here, it's interesting. Because you know, Rick, because you know him, who's from the beginning. And we'll be there at the end. This is not vacation Bible school knowing. This is, I've walked with him through some stuff. I know him. You guys know the story of Job? This is the Will's, the Will's summary of it, okay? Job's the man of God. Satan's walking along. God's like, Satan, where are you at? Right? This, is, this is the Bible. You should go read it yourself, but it doesn't say it like I'm saying it. Where are you at? Oh, I've just been walking back and forth around the earth looking for someone to mess with. Jesus is like, oh, God's like, okay. Um, hey, consider my boy Job. He's a good dude. He will, he worships me. He trusts me. Like, he's mine. Go mess with him. And, and he won't turn from me. He won't curse my name. Satan's like, yeah, he will. No, no, seriously. You can't, you can't destroy him, but you can mess with him big time. So it's like, okay. So he goes and messes with him. Does all these awful things, including like killing their kids and livestock. But it says this. He goes back and forth. It's like Satan says, okay, can I do it? He says, yeah, sure. Satan just kicks him right, right in the crotch, right? And then God, it says after that, basically comes up and does stuff too. Like, oh, that's not enough. Now God comes and gives him a punch. And pretty soon this dude's life is in shambles and ruins. And some of this was inflicted by Satan and some was inflicted by God. And then he has all his friends like, where's your God now, dude? Why don't you just curse him and die? Even his wife, right? He's supposed to be his helpmate. She wasn't very helpful, right? Curse your, father, curse your God and then die. He doesn't. So that's this guy's story. And then God turns around because he doesn't, stops it, blesses him to greater standing than he was before. Crazy story. From Job, there's this line. It says, agree with God and be at peace. Thereby, God will come to you. How does this look in life? If, if I look at the shadow, right, our lives, I can interact with people who have uh, more years of experience than me, and they've been through things. And you know what's one cool thing about age? And young people, we don't, the younger you are, the, more, the less you get it, right? And the people who are in the middle are struggling to get it. But in every disappointment, there's great lessons if you let it happen. And in certain areas of your life, as you get older, you become unfazed. You're like, yeah. Oh, well, right? A lot of your hope in the things of this world has started to dwindle away because they've been taken from you, right? Like you knew whether your kids were going to make a million dollars and take care of you when you got old. It's already happened. It did either happened or it didn't, right? Like marriage, you already know you weren't going to do it better and perfect, right? Health, you already know it's really 
not necessarily 100% up to you how that goes down. You already have buried somebody you loved. You have already, you know, done whatever career you were going to do. And so all the things that young people are caught up in, you're not. And what's left is like, agree with God that he's good and be at peace. And from that, you're going to see his goodness. Okay, so there's those three categories. I put it in three handy boxes right here because we love linear things. We love categories. We love will. Of course, I'm supposed to walk in some sort of progressive development here because I've been reborn, right? Like, yeah, right? Like, obviously, I should have been reborn here, and now I'm like here, right? Obviously, especially if you got gray or white hair. You better be here, right? Wrong. Here's where truth and experience must dance, so let's dance. The truth is, in every one of you and in me, what you see is all three of these areas at work. What do you mean by that, Will? It's fascinating to watch. The truth says you're reborn, regenerated. Your experience you watch, you're like, wow. Out of that person's mouth one day was like the most parental, wise, like Jedi master saying, and they believed it right? We're talking full ninja. We're talking Miyagi, right? Like, holy cow, they said that and it knocked me off my feet. And then the next minute, it's like a kid in a candy store who didn't get the lollipop they wanted. Get in their feet and get, 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 right? You see this. And you'll really see this if you carry a mirror around and watch yourself because you will do that too, okay? So why stop here before we talk more about regeneration is because I want you to understand this. I want you, this is basically your homework for this week. I want you to look at this. I want you to be aware that most people here, right, you can act childlike. How do I know when I'm acting childlike? When I must have my way and when I'm, and I'm going back and forth like in the wind. And what happens is this, and I'm thinking of cool ways to illustrate it, But what happens is there's this like washing of regeneration and renewal. And so even though regeneration and renewal are an instantaneous thing, kind of what's happening here is there's these parts of your life, right? Parts of your life can be complicated in so many things. It's your opinions, it's your values, it's what you It's what you think about. And regeneration has to hit all the aspects of your life. You get this? It's got to cover the full area of your life. Because in one area where you haven't walked with God, you haven't grown up. In another area where you have walked with God, you've got tremendous growth. So what ends up happening is we are people dependent on the one-time event of being a new creation. However, dependent on the constant renewal over time, a washing of regeneration. So it's like this. It's like there's a blemish on my hand. And what happens is, over time, right, there's this washing and this renewal, and it's a continuous thing, and it's working, it's magic, right, over time. And it's washing and renewing us, is what Titus, the book of Titus says. This is what Paul's explaining, like, you become dependent on that washing and that renewal. So for you to be prepared to kind of walk in that, prepared to let yourself be renewed and restored, you've got to be aware of where you're acting, in these areas and let God come into those areas through the Holy Spirit is the one who regenerates you. So for instance, like look at my life for example. I have a, I'm a baby when it comes to watching my kids become adults. My oldest son will be legally an adult this fall. Weird, right? This is new. Like when it comes to that, my wife and I could act very childlike because the renewal and the regeneration, the rebirth hasn't hit that part of our life yet because we don't know. Now we've had this experience twice of God took us on a journey where we, we were making a certain income and it, our income actually cut in half, but our blessing increased. So now when it talks about money, we're talking ninja master, right? Not phased, Okay. When it comes to me being a husband, I I pray that I'm growing, but I can tell you at times, sometimes I'm a baby and I want what I want, right? Like this. And I'm just like, oh, the best wife ever, the worst wife ever. Like I've caught myself in that these past couple years and I feel like I'm, I'm growing in that because I'm being washed and renewed in regeneration and there's that hope 
And as the pastor, if I'm supposed to pretend to tell you I'm parent across the board, I'd be lying to you. And I want you to stop lying to yourself. Because so many times, even as a pastor, I come up here like a young adult, right? Like, this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true. Who cares what's true if you got no love? That's what the parent knows. The truth and the love together. Sometimes I need a hammer. Sometimes I need sandpaper. Sometimes I need a screwdriver. Sometimes I need a saw. The washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. If, if you think of the Holy Spirit in that metaphor of, of the oil, I mean, you could picture this. If you had prongs of your life, like, oh man, this is like, okay, this is me professionally, this is my health, this is my finances, this is my sexuality, this is my friendships, this is my marriage and my uh, extended family, right? And, and my health, all these areas of your life, it's like the Holy Spirit, which does the regenerating. It's like it's oil being poured, right? And it's making its way. And right now, it's, it's overcoming this. And it's washing and renewing and regenerating that part of your life. And pretty soon, you start to see things differently. Pretty soon, the kingdom of God, which is present, becomes open to you, right? You see it with your eyes and you start to look at that different and you're no longer that child and it'll take you through that process. You'll become that young adult who's overcome the truth but what'll happen is you'll be so zealous and then you'll find that place if you agree with God where you'll find peace. But then it's coming, you know, it's coming to this area and it's making its way in and so you're being made new. That makes sense? This is the beginning. This is, like I said, this is a lake I can't give to you all on one Sunday. But I'd love you to start with thinking about this. Thinking about, look at your life, first of all. Start with you. Look at your life. Take an inventory of those areas. I mean, even get out a journal. If you don't do this, I'm telling you, you want to grow? Like, write some stuff down and just say, wow, in this area, I'm acting just like a child. In this area, wow, that was very, like, proud, very young adult, very arrogant. Very smug. And then in this area, just praise God, you're like, wow, I handled that, like, really maturely. Let's get all of those areas like that. And then, then, then I think once you see that, it's going to be kind of automatic. You're going to start loving your neighbor as yourself, as the great commandment says. Because you're going to understand you've been through some things. And you once were this. But now, you're new in Christ. And you'll start to see the people around you and you'll be like, whoa, where did that come from? That person seems so mature. Oh, yeah. Childlike behavior because you took my sucker, right? Like, you begin to see that and you're like, ah. Okay. Let me read this over, over you real quick. We're going to pray. We'll sing some praises to God, and we'll just, we're going to pick this back up next week and talk some more about it. Let me just bring that idea of, of being uh, at different stages of spiritual maturity. Titus 3, 3 through 7 says this. I just want to just read this over you guys. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of, of our God, our Savior appeared, he saved us not because the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Lord, we just pray. We pray that you're uh, 
just glorified in this, Lord. I pray that you would just search us. That you would know us. That you reveal where you're working in our life. Help us begin to look at ourselves in terms of that, Lord. The child and the young adult and the parent. And bring, Lord, through the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, bring to our mind, to our thought, to our consideration these areas. That we might bring them before you, God. That we might bring them to you. That you might keep working and teaching us and growing us up in Christ Jesus knowing that we've been recreated and reborn in your image, that our lives might be honor, respect, glory, and praise to you, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen.